towards you as faculty, um, would you be able to spot the stress level of your students if they don't talk about it? <laughs> and what do you do with that information? Okay. I'm, I'm the first to slaughter here. <laughs> um, you know, I, I thought this was a great question um, because personally, um, I probably don't. So if, um, I mean, I'm not completely an oblivious advisor. Um, there are definitely um, signs I can see in students. Um, signs that I recognized in my peers when we were going through graduate school. Uh, for instance, um, um, some of my male friends from graduate school, when they were going through hard times, they just stopped shaving, they stopped caring about how they looked. And it's not necessarily just the appearance, but it was coupled to maybe um, being more grumpy. Uh, so, so those are kind of clues I cue in on. Um, my female friends, um, tended to dye their hair when they were really stressed <laughs> or bake um, because for, for them baking was a release of that stress but honestly um, I was more in tune for peers than I am for my own students sometimes and so I would really appreciate I think um, having an open conversation about this hearing from you guys um, like um, is there a, there maybe you feel there's a stigma about talking about stress to your advisor, but personally I would appreciate it because it would help me uh, be a better advisor. Um, I mean, as you've heard from all of us, we all have been stressed and we don't deal well with stress. So we're not going to judge, I think, um, students who voice their stress. And I think actually it's really it would be great to have that openness, I think, for an advisor with their students. And if other students in the group see it, then um, I think that would be helpful for everyone. So I have to say, I don't really have a great solution to this. Um, but I would say that, um, no, I, I don't think I would necessarily spot it. Yeah, scientists are notoriously bad at reading social cues. So. Um, <laughs> I would say that your advisors and your peers may not be the best at noticing that something's wrong. Um, I, I'm sure I fail at recognizing that my students are overly stressed. Um, and I also, my personal, um, I guess, belief, my philosophy is that, um, is that some stress is good. And so if somebody comes to me and says, Man, I'm really stressed out about what you're as, have, asking me to do here. This is this is really. I've been thinking about it all day. I can't stop thinking about it. There's a part of me that that says to myself, "This is great. They're really thinking hard on this. This is good." And so um, that that boundary of when being stressed is too stressed is hard for me to recognize personally. Um, I can recognize that somebody's stressed. But I can't always tell that it's too stressed. And sometimes I think it's okay for them to be stressed to a certain point. But not to the breaking point. Not to Recognizing the breaking point. Breaking yeah, point and that's, I'm, I'm not very good at finding that yeah. point. So I guess the answer to the question is no. <laughs> <laughs> I think there have been a handful. I can, I can probably point. Well, there, there are less times what I've noticed a student has been stressed and been right about it, right? Because we're. We never really know what's on somebody else's mind until you talk to them. And even after you talk to them, you're not necessarily 100% sure what's on their mind. There have been a few times when I've been able to recognize it, but there have been uh, many other times that I, I haven't. Um, say, uh, and I probably, I, we, we only, as advisors, we only have the, we only have a, we have a, we have an incomplete data set. We only hear from, it's the students that we hear from that then we know about. So there are some students that I can say I've, in, in my lab, I've probably talked to certain students more about stress than other ones. And they're usually the people that are more willing to come talk to me about it, that receive more of my attention on that topic. Um, but my door, I mean, even when my door is closed, it's open. <laughs> my, my students know that. The window's there. Right. So, in there. That's not, uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, I guess I, I've missed it. Um, but something else that, that came up when I, when I started researching 
stress more. I, I gave a talk to my group last year about, about stress. Um, is that the people who study stress have looked at human populations and found that there are only, there are only two subset populations that they can find of people that generally don't experience stress. They're Buddhist monks that are deep, deep into meditation and mindfulness and all that sort of stuff. Do not have standard stress responses. And uh, psychopaths. <laughs> the other people who don't experience stress. Uh, but I think we'd like to we'd like to be more like the Buddhist monks. I think not psychopaths, right? <laughs> psychopaths probably something's broken. In there. Stress is highly. And the other research I found, or body of work that I found when I, when I was doing research on this, is that stress is intimately tied with learning. That they're not necess they're, they they can't necessarily be separated. Um, we we experience when we experience stress and when we overcome stress. Uh, there's chemistry going on. Sorry, I'm the organic chemist up here, so I gotta talk about the organic chemistry of stress. Uh, there's two main types of stress. There's acute stress. This is the public speaking stress. This is what they used to use as a test for this. And that's adrenaline, is the stress hormone associated with that. When you successfully complete a task that overcomes an adrenaline based stress situation, your body converts adrenaline into dopamine. You get a chemical reward for overcoming stress. And that's very associated with learning, right? The dopamine response is very much how we learn. Chronic stress is associated with cortisol, which is a steroid. It's also associated with inflammation. And so chronic stress situations just have a whole host of other things associated with them. And in graduate school, we get both, right? We get, we get chronic stress and we get acute stress of your thesis, your third-year talk, your written exam, your oral exam, your job interviews, all that stuff. Both chronic and acute stress situations associated with them. So, if you think back to the like classes and other stuff that you've learned throughout your life, there's probably stress associated with that too, of exams or not wanting to let the coach down or whatever, whatever your parents down or something like that. There's there's stress associated with all those learning type events. The when you're pushed past the breaking point, though, and that, that came up too, that's that's a really that's a ne that's a very negative situation. Optimal learning seems to be when there's enough stress to encourage a response, a learning response, right? and not too much stress to break some, somebody. But that point is going to be different for everybody. But we have certain milestones along the graduate program that are the same for everyone, so we have to think. Each person, each advisor pair should be thinking a little bit about, you know, okay, what works for everybody, but then what works specifically for the student. But we all appreciate research is not linear. Yeah. Um, we, we know that. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Buddy? Alright, so kind of along that same line here, what's the best way for a student to bring up talking about stress with an advisor? I or is there just had one the most way? I got it, right? <laughs> the direct approach has worked the best with me. <laughs> yeah, please be blunt. <laughs> As Aaron said, we're we're not uh, you know we're, yeah we're not the best at picking up on certain things, and I'm not here. So the direct approach has worked the best with me, and sometimes that's a student just showing up at my office. Uh, I've responded to emails too, and, and I think I've learned enough to that when I get an email about stress, I'm just like, either encourage them to come talk to me or go talk to the person and basically uh, initiate the conversation, start the conversation. Um, I think most of us would, I can't speak for all my colleagues, but I think most of us would prefer the direct approach, just, just put it out there. Um, and. Uh, because yeah, if if, if, it, if if you're already at the overwhelmed point, then, then it's easy. It's it's uh, it, we, we all want to sort of, and I'm the same way when I'm in a big stressful situation too. I want to feel like I can just handle it on my own, right? I should be able to get through this. I should just be able to do this without that, without you know, without. But then when I think about the really stressful situations that I've been in my life, um, I've really never gotten through them without help, honestly. I've always had help from 
somebody, whether or not it's a friend or uh, my wife or my family uh, or my research group. Um, I've always had hope. I think to the past when I've had um, students who were very stressed out at one stage of their career, and I think um, just starting the conversation is helpful because what I've noticed um, from my past experience um, is that actually the stress was induced by unrealistic expectations um, that they thought they needed so much more to graduate and they didn't <laughs> or that they had a hard time leaving the lab uh, to start writing their thesis because they felt what they had done up until that point uh, wasn't enough. And so as an advisor, um, you know, we're, we can be much more pragmatic and practical and assess more, much more objectively. I think that's a hard part. I mean, I remember being a grad student, being so tied to my research emotionally. Um, I had to learn, um, you know, writing the highs is great. Your research is going well, you're happy, life is good. But to avoid the lows, you know, your experiments aren't working. That's not a reflection of you. Um, you know, but you can't help but feel that your confidence plummets in yourself, right? At some point, you have to realize if the chemistry doesn't work, that's the chemistry. It was a bad experiment, and let's do something else. So I think um, trying to remove myself from the ups and downs of results emotionally um, was a key part of learning to be effective in the lab. Basically, um, always have the optimism that things will work, but when things don't, just um, you know, don't feel that that's you, that you have bad hands, that you, because it's not. And, and I know it's hard sometimes for my students to talk about negative results, but oftentimes I learn from them. Um, so I take the approach that, okay, that was a dumb idea of mine. <laughs> let's, let's shelve that and move on. So, um, so don't feel bad about talking about things that don't work. Um, the science is not a reflection of, of your capability. Or, sorry to yeah no to, go ahead you know, that, that's such a great that's such a great point to, to talk about those sorts of things because even if it even if it is your hands and it might be because <laughs> I know some because I, I know I heard I heard you okay. say that and it was a great point okay but, but even I, if it I had, is you can address it it could be <laughs> but yeah it could be you but you might not know that you you wouldn't know it right or you might be afraid that it's you right and that could be a stressful thing as you think wow, did I screw that up? Because I've certainly screwed stuff up in the lab. <laughs> Sometimes it was me. I had bad technique at times. Right? Um, but the only way you're going you're gonna to learn is to kind of be, you're going to have to be a little bit vulnerable and kind of put that out there that you, it didn't work. And so that your advisor or your other lab mates can help teach you. So you got to remember that there's a student part of the graduate student, and that means that you're I, I don't have much to add. I, I think that for me, um, saying something directly to me is probably the best way to tell me that something is too much. I've definitely had students in my group come to me and say, I just need a break, and that they needed some time away from the lab, and I'm fine with that. So. But I also also say, just before that happened, I didn't know that they were going to say that to me. Thank <laughs> you.